I'm Father Mitch Papel, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. Tonight, we'll speak with a Catholic scientist about how he uses reason to prove that God exists. Something very important in these times when so many people give up faith in God. First, we would like to speak with EWTN's Director of Acquisitions and Co-Productions, Mr. John Elson, about an upcoming special program. John, you, what do you have for us yeah, this time? Thank you. Well, it's good to be with you, Father. I want to let our audience know that this upcoming Friday, August 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern, we'll be presenting an original docudrama entitled Hope, Our Lady of Knock. And this program presents the approved Marian apparition that took place in the village of Knock, Ireland, which is in the western part of Ireland, mm -hmm. in 1879. Our Lady appeared with the evangelist St. John, mm -hmm. St. Joseph, our Lord in the form of a lamb on an unadorned altar, surrounded by angels. And this occurred, as I said, in 1879, which was preceded by the great potato famine of 1845, which right. we know killed a million Irish, caused the immigration of, of hundreds of thousands of others. And, th and then in 1879, there was a second, what they called a little famine. Mm -hmm. And so Our Lady appeared uh, in that time of great darkness. And we all are experiencing our own darkness now with this COVID-19 virus. We don't know how long it's going to continue. Many of us have been either directly or indirectly, all of us have been indirectly impacted, some directly. Sure. So we, I think the virtue of, of hope, uh, which we know from scripture does not disappoint, is something that we all could use a little bit more of. Yes. And we pray that uh, this program will allow Our Lady to become present to us in our time, just as she was in the 19th century. So we have a brief clip to share yeah, with everyone. Take a look at that clip about hope, Our Lady of Knock. It was 1847 and the potato crop failed because we were under foreign rule at that time. Quite a lot of the resources of the country left the country. I can't believe they're taking food out of the country. People not knowing whether they'd have literally have a roof over their head that evening. Oh, there's nowhere else to go. Save them alone! Get down! I suppose it's, it's the presence. If she could be present at the cross, to deal with that for other people around her at the time. She can be present to us now in dealing with whatever suffering that we are going through. Our Holy Mother has appeared at the chapel. Quickly, come to you see. Oh my goodness. What a vision. Why us? All right, so this is called Hope, Our Lady of Knock. Correct. It will be broadcast on Friday, August 21st, uh, and that will be at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Watch it on EWTN and EWTN.com, or you can get a copy of this as a video by going to our religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. It is n item number H D O L K for our lady to knock. That's right. Because <laughs> uh, it's Hadok. H D O L K. John, thank you, Father. Thank you for God letting us you. know about this. Thank you. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with our guest tonight, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We have a guest, of course, tonight. He is a Catholic philosopher and scientist 
who specializes in human genetics. He's the author of a number of books, but tonight we are going to discuss his book called A Catholic Scientist Proves God Exists by Dr. Gerard Fischerin. Uh, Dr. Fischerin, how are you tonight? I am fine, Father Mitch. I hope you are too. Oh yeah, just fine indeed. Uh, this yeah. is a, a topic that I really am happy for us to address. Uh, you've written a number of good books, but uh, this one is, is a very interesting topic. To have a book where you, as a scientist, prove God exists. Now here's going to be my question. Did you perform a scientific experiment to demonstrate that God exists? What is so interesting behind your question is that you are wording what most people think. Yep. When we talk about proofs, it must be done through experiments. Yep. An experiment proves everything. That's what science claims. Yep. And, and we have been... Um, brainwashed, bombarded with the idea that only science can prove something. But uh, I have bad news for those people. No, uh, science don't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. I hope it's uh, it's not too shocking for too many people. It's, uh, it is uh, not really possible to prove much in science. Uh, science works with hypotheses, and that hypothesis can be wrong. And even if we get more and more confirmation, case after case after case, experiment after experiment, that does not mean it has been proven. Um, in, in my other books, I mention many cases where science was wrong. Many times it was wrong. My famous case in my human genetics for years, we taught students and, and human beings that all human beings have 48 chromosomes. But it turned out, after three decades almost, that we have only 46. So science was wrong for a long time. And I could mention many, many, many more, but, but you probably don't care about it and your uh, audience doesn't either. All I want to say is science cannot really prove much. It cannot even disprove much. And it certainly cannot prove God's existence. Why yeah. not? God is not a material entity. Um, science works with anything that can be counted, quantified, measured, dissected, dissected. But God is not a material entity. So science cannot prove or disprove God's existence. Yeah. Besides, God cannot be trapped by some kind of ingenious experiment. I have never come up with an experiment that could trap him. And then finally, and there are many more reasons, but let's keep it short, God is not a hypothesis. A hypothesis you hold on for a while, tentatively and provisionally, until you come up with a better one. But God is not a hypothesis. God is the explanation behind our lives. So where can we find proofs of God's existence? Not in science, not even in mathematics, but in logic and rationality. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to show in my book. Exactly, exactly. And that's uh, uh, and, and a good job that it is. Um, I, I think, um, you know, we, we have to recognize there are different realms of knowledge. For instance, as a scientist, you cannot demonstrate by experiment that your mother loves you. You can show by her actions she did a lot of kindnesses, but you could still hypothesize that she was working tricks to fool you in that, into thinking that she loved you. You can't yes. prove her love for you. You take it on a certain faith that your mother loves you. And that's not a bad proposition to have faith 
that your mother loves you. How, though, do we deal with the existence of God? How do we come to knowledge of that using reason? You, there are some famous proofs of God's existence. In my book, I mentioned six of them, but there are many more. Yes. Um, but what, what is so basic to those proofs of God's existence? You know, science can uh, say um, when you heat iron, it will expand, and they can confirm that and confirm that and confirm that. But there are certain statements that cannot be confirmed because they are true evidently, absolutely. And one of them is everything that happens needs a cause. There is no one who can deny that. If, if a scientist says, I, I came up with something that does not have a cause, then that person should be sent to an asylum. There is something wrong with that person. Yeah. Everyone will say everything that happens needs a cause. We know nothing can make itself to happen. Nothing comes from nothing. Yeah. You cannot be your own father or your own mother. For yeah. something to make itself exist or cause itself to exist, it would have to exist before it came into existence, which is absurd, which is nonsense. So I can say to every human being, Catholic, Christian, atheist, whatever, if you accept that everything that happens needs a cause, then I can start with you and we can talk. And, and, and that is the beginning of the proofs of God's existence, at least one of the proofs. I think the, the, the one that is the most commonsensical one that everyone will understand. So if, if you agree, I would like to go into that one and, and show why that is unavoidable, no. why God must exist. The, this is exactly what I would love to see you go into. This is, uh, yeah, so please. So if we accept that everything that happens needs a cause, then most people will say, oh, yeah, I know. The cause of me is my parents. Mm -hmm. And my parents, the cause of them is their grandparents. And I could go on and on and on, sure. even if that is endless. But did I explain anything? N not really. Because where do those parents ultimately come from? What makes them able to generate new generations? Where mm -hmm. does that come from? So I, I always say, if you have a, a series of causes that goes on and on and on, and science does that also, it says, oh, uh, molecules can be explained by atoms, and atoms can be explained by subatomic particles, etc. Again, that whole series of causes, that chain, is basically useless. It's like a, a, an endless series of IOUs. But IOUs don't give you real currency. So I, I need something else. We need a chain that does not float in the air, but that has a foundation to rest on or a beam to hang from. And that is where Thomas Aquinas comes in and he says, everything that happens needs a cause. Yes, but those causes cannot go on infinitely, forever and ever and ever. There has to be something outside that chain of causes for the chain to be possible. Why parents can have children, and why grandparents can create parents and parents' children. And that cause, it's another kind of cause, sure. is what Thomas Aquinas calls the first cause or more technical, the primary cause. Sure. God is the primary cause. And from that, he, he derives, he said, you don't have to be a, a Christian or a Catholic. Everyone has to accept that there must be something that is existence itself. My existence depends on other causes. Mm -hmm. But all those causes together, where do they come from? the primary cause. Science is about secondary causes. They can talk as long as they want. It's all secondary causes. But the primary cause is necessary for the chain to be founded or to hang from somewhere. So there must be a first cause. And that first cause is pure existence, pure 
motion, design, etc., etc., etc. A necessary being, the cosmic designer, a divine intellect, call it whatever you want. And that is not deniable. If you deny that, then you are giving up on your starting point, which is a premise that says every cause that came into existence must have a cause. And that cause is ultimately existence itself. Did I make my case? Yeah, well, there's one question that I get fairly frequently. And I hear it on radio and TV. Who caused God? Who got God created? How did he get made? What would you say yeah. to that question? Yeah. It is a, a very good question. And all those people who ask that question, at least they are thinking with you when you are explaining things. And even great people like um, uh, uh, scientists like uh, uh, Dawkins and, John, and Hawking, they all make the same objection. They say those proofs of existence, they ultimately end up nonsense because the first cause must have a cause too. So we still end up with an infinite series of causes. No. Thomas Aquinas and all the people who defend that argument would say everything that comes into existence needs a cause. But God never came into existence. He has always been. He's always uh, universal. He's always divine intellect. So he does not need a cause. As uh, Peter Kreef, the philosopher, Catholic philosopher, says, the buck stops with God. Why? Because God did not come into existence, and therefore he doesn't need an explanation. He is self-explanatory. Right. That's the answer I would give to those people. Mm -hmm. See, that's, that, that's one of the things that a lot of folks have trouble understand they, they in one hand in philosophy say he they give god contingent being that he depends on something else like everybody like all creatures do but we creatures do depend on something to make us and to get us going and this is something that we uh don't see with god that's exactly where it stops. If God had a creator, then it would mean he's not really God. He's, he's a not creature. the first cause. Yes, correct. And so, so he, he doesn't, he, then that being would have to be God, but it's where it must stop and that uh, it's someone who is not moved but moves everything else that exists. That's, yes. that's the difference. And I think th this is where, you know, uh, when we talk about uh, in, in science that there's a Big Bang theory, well, didn't the Big Bang create everything? I mean, the universe was at one time a very small object, and then everything exists in this great explosion. So isn't the Big Bang our creator? Yeah, yeah but the, the, the question is, you, 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 what you say is, is perfectly right. That's what a lot of people would say. Yeah. And, uh, and as I, I mentioned already, um, Hawking, uh, um, the famous uh, astrophysicist who, who died not too long ago, is the man that we probably all know from the wheelchair. He, uh, he, he would say, the, Universe created itself. Right. That is real magic. How can something create itself? In order to create itself, it has to exist before it came into existence, which is which is logical nonsense. Sorry, um, um, Hawking, you are a good physicist, but you are not a good philosopher. So he uh, he says, yeah, the universe created itself, and many with him say the same thing. But if the universe created itself, then we forget the question, where does that universe come from? 
how can it create what we are? Human beings came out of the universe. We know all of that. and But we have to accept that the universe cannot create itself. First of all, it needs laws of nature. The gravity, the law of gravity, for instance. Where does the law of gravity come from? Did that fall out of the sky? It, it, yeah, it, it fell out of heaven. That's true. But not out of the sky. So it, it has to come from somewhere. Who was the lawgiver for the law of gravity? The law of gravity needs a lawgiver. But most scientists don't like that idea. That's why nowadays they, they don't even like the idea of laws anymore. They say a law, there's nothing that is just a description of, a, um, of things that go together, um, always connected. No, it is a real law. Things have to follow that law in order to work properly, to function properly. Where do they come from? The first cause. I cannot get along that. And, and some people say, oh, matter is the first cause. Matter cannot be the first cause where it is, it, it, it moves, it is not, it depends on other things to exist. And in order to exist, depending on other things, you are, as you said earlier, you are contingent. You could not have been. The law of gravity could not have been. If something could not have been, then it's not self-explanatory. It cannot explain itself. So it needs an explanation beyond itself. Yep. God. Yeah. First and, course. And this is something I, I, I think for folks to understand um, that uh, it, 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 uh, this may not be the best approach to philosophy, but I cannot help but be absolutely astounded that there are these uh, 20 or so constants in the universe, like gravity oh, yeah. or yeah. the speed of light. The speed of light is the same here as it is at the other end of the galaxy, of the universe. It's just a constant. And this is, and there, there are about 20 of these constants, and they're extremely precise. Every one of the constants is precise. And yes. ev every, <clears throat> and they all have to be there together. So, I mean, by precise, it's, uh, there, there are a lot of zeros that if there was a variation of point zero to lots of them, uh, I mean, huge numbers of zeros, point one, if there's a slight variation, the whole universe can't exist. But no. all of these are extremely finely tuned to each other. They make the universe possible. And the, I, I guess I'm impressed that it took the human race 300,000 years of existence before we could figure out that these constants even exist. But yes. the divine mind not only knows they exist, but created them into the physical universe. So that the Big Bang is not just a random explosion like some firework. It's also this finely tuned reality that, that includes the pos all the things possible for our universe to exist. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you used the word fine tuned. For, for many people, the fact that those values of the, the weak nuclear force, the strong nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and gravity, that they have specific values that is almost an indication, not a proof. This is scientific. It cannot prove, as I said before. Yes, okay. But it's a very strong indication that those things were fine-tuned somehow. So for, for scientists, that is very hard. They say, no, that is coincidental. And uh, <laughs> no, I would say the Book of Wisdom said it right. You have arranged, it's talking to God, you have arranged, all things by measure and number and weight. God did that. And scientists don't like that 
conclusion. Yeah, it's not really a conclusion, but that indication, that pointer to God. They don't like it. So, for instance, the, the, the man I mentioned before, Stephen Hawking, a great physicist, but not a great philosopher, he comes up with a solution that says, oh, it's coincidental. And he uses the, the law of the large numbers. Uh, the law of the large numbers says if you have thousands of planets, there has got to be one that is correct, that is the one we need for life. Or he goes even further. <coughs> he says, yeah, if they all come from uh, laws of nature, there could be multi-universes. And they all have different laws of nature, all coincidental, but ultimately it doesn't matter. There will be one that is the way we are now. That's why you can't prove that fine-tuning uh, points to God. Right. But if you assume through the proofs of God's existence that there is a first cause, then it is almost unavoidable that you say everything on this earth is fine-tuned for us. We cannot calculate those constants from uh, uh, any, any theory at this moment in physics. So we have to assume that they were just given that value by the Creator. Which, this, one of the points, uh, some of the points that you make in your book are to talk about God being all-knowing and all-powerful. Um, and it, it, in some ways, to say that this universe had a cause means that the cause of the universe has to be more powerful than the universe itself. Correct. Yeah. And if, if it's if it's if it's as as powerful as all of us, it's useless. Then it's not a first cause. It then it has become a secondary cause. Right. Secondly, with these constants that are fine tuned in the universe. It would also require super intelligence to know what the fine tuning must look like and then the superpower to enact that fine tuning. That would yes. seem logical to me. Yes, you, you, you are perfectly right. I, uh, I try in my book to explain that, why God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present. He has to be, because there is no time in God. There is no space in God. God is timeless. God is spaceless. Even St. Augustine knew that. He didn't need... Albert Einstein to show us that space and time are physical entities. They come with creation. So what, what always helps me to, to understand that is Thomas Aquinas makes an important distinction between creating and producing. Mm -hmm. He says producing is co making something out of something else that exists already. So I can make a loaf of bread. Creating out of some flour, water, and eggs. Yes. You can. But, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say I could do it well, but, if I, <laughs> but that would be producing. Yes. But it's not creating. Right. Uh, yeah, most people would say, yeah, you are very creative when you do that. But still, uh, when God creates, he creates from nothing. Yes. So there is nothing that he uses in order to do that. That is a very old dogma in the church. God creates from nothing, in, in, in Latin, ex nihilo. And so he doesn't use anything that exists already. He does not even use dust of the earth. He just creates from nothing. And at the moment, God takes his creation away that goes back to nothing. Everything goes back to nothing, unless God keeps creating and holds it into existence. And for, for me, that is an important distinction that Thomas Aquinas makes. So I, I can see why everything science does is about producing something from something else. But 
the, the Big Bang, for instance, it creates something from something else, but the Big Bang itself was created. It came from nothing. Yes. And thanks to God, who has the power to do that, there is something rather than nothing, mm -hmm. as another philosopher used to say. Why is there something rather than nothing? Yes. Because there is a God, there is a creator. Yes, yes. And I think um, for us to consider this very seriously, uh, the, the, the only other objection that I have heard from, uh, from some uh, very intelligent young people is that, well, you know, a lot of times we, people used to say that God sent a storm when in fact we know that due to various air currents over West Africa and the Sahara that there are regular productions of hurricanes and we can trace those water currents and air currents that lead to hurricanes. And we don't need God to explain it. We don't need the pagan gods to explain the origin of the planets. And someday, just as science now proves that the Big Bang occurred rather than battles between the gods, someday we'll be able to prove by science that we don't need to believe in any god. It's just the physical universe making itself. And that Hawking's is right, that's just the physical universe, and we'll just figure out a way to explain how it all exists without any God. That's something of the rationalist's hope. How would you respond to such a person? I would say even if, if, we, if we accept that the Big Bang is proven, um, and I'm always a little skeptical to say that it was really proven. You know, I, I have learned my lesson in the history of science. You know, when uh, Max Planck, the one of the, the quantum theory, mm -hmm. when he was going to study physics, uh, his professor told him, don't, don't go there. Uh, science is finished. Well, <laughs> we, have no, we have news for him. And even Planck, Max Planck, he showed that science was not finished at all. Right. And he came up with uh, quantum theory. So even if someone says the, the Big Bang is a proven entity, I, I will say, OK, OK, let's go for a, for a while with that hypothesis. Uh, we may come up with a better solution. But whatever solution we come up with, we will never be able to explain why the laws of nature are the way they are, why those basic forces of physical constants of physics are the way they are. If we just say, yeah, that's the way it is, that is, that is poor philosophy. Uh, I think uh, Peter Kreeft calls that the black box theory. We, we cannot explain why things are the way they are. We just accept it. That's the way they are. So you, you have to ask the question, why are they the way they are? Where do they come from? And um, I, I must say, when, uh, when we do that kind of things, we have to go beyond what we learn in science classes or what we were indoctrinated with in our experiments. There is always a deeper level. Where, do, where does everything come from? And that question cannot be denied. If you deny it, okay, then you just say, sorry, uh, I have no explanation. But not giving an explanation is not an explanation. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It becomes somewhat circular. And sometimes, you know, I, I'll hear people propose the theory, well, these are just a number of accidents that occurred over time that made it possible for there to be 
a planet such as ours on which life can exist, and it's just a series of accidents that about 500 million years after the Earth cooled, there was starting to be life, and then there would be life that could breathe oxygen, and then the other critters come along. And these are just a series of accidents that occurred. And I sometimes uh, would answer back to them, well, if everything is that kind of an accident, then I must conclude that your theory about everything being an accident of history is just one more of those accidents. Yes, correct. <laughs> when I, and when I start to apply their theory to their own theory, they get very, very upset. Because yes. they wanted yes. to apply to everybody else's idea, but not to their own. Yeah. Now, Dr. Fischer, we need to take a little break. So if you just wait with us, please, we'll be back in a couple minutes and continue on this discussion about the existence of God. Great. Right, we are with Dr. Gerard Fischerin, uh, joining us via Skype from Atkinson, New Hampshire. Uh, and I was just saying uh, before the break how those scientists who, and philosophers who point out that everything is an accident and that's just a series of accidents that occur, that if that's true, then the belief of the Christian in Christianity is an accident. The belief of the aboriginal person that rocks and trees are deities and the belief of the scientist are yes. all equally accidents. Yes. And the... Yes. the, the None of the three like believing that. <laughs> it, it, it goes against our sense. No, I'm, uh, science is true, and we got to hold that. So, <laughs> how, yeah. and you say, well, it's just an accident. So, you're part of your environment and your training to believe in this, and your reaction is part of your environment. Uh, what would you say to that? Yes, I, uh, I, I think always of Charles Darwin, who, who claims that his theory of evolution is true. Yes. But the man at least realized at one point, very briefly, he had probably a very enlightened moment in his life. He said, one might wonder whether the mind of man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animal, can be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions. Darwin, that is a great thought. You realize that you have undermined your own theory of evolution. And I, I always say the same about people who say DNA is all that counts. It determines who you are, what you think, what you believe. If that is true, then what I believe and think is worth nothing but a molecule. Yeah. 
a molecule can be heavy, light, stable, unstable, but opinions, claims, scientific theories are true or false. There is no true or false in the DNA world. There is no true or false in the molecular world. So people who claim that everything is a coincidence, they are undermining their own claim. And that's basically the point you made too, but uh, I, I put it in a scientific context. Science cannot claim anything if that's the case. I always say, did Watson, when Watson and Crick discovered DNA, was it their DNA that discovered DNA? That would be a real miracle. So there must have been more than that. And that is a person who was created by God, who was able to learn things and know things and test things and do things. That would be my response to uh, the great remark you had before the break. Sure. I, I, I think then the other option, and, and here's, because uh, I, I don't think that science is merely an accident of history. I think it's a no. great gift. Yep. No, I, 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 I wish I were a, uh, better at it, but I cherish those who are able to think scientifically and do the research and present that. I, I, I think that is a, a, such a great thing. But what it brings out is that at a certain point, we cherish scientists on the basis of an act of faith, that yes. it is not an accident, that it is a good, it's good for the human race, and that it's not even something that I can prove that science is scientific. I believe it on, as a good act of faith that science yes. is worthwhile. And yes. this is something that might help those in certain areas of science be a little bit more humble about their enterprise. As wonderful as it is, there also has to be a certain humility about this. Yes, I, I, I wish they would even have the humility to realize where science came from. Where did it come from? Not from China, not from the Islam countries. It did not come from uh, uh, primitive countries. It came from a Judeo-Christian background. Why? Because in the Judeo-Christian belief, the faith, we are created by God to investigate and study and explore his creation. He made us in his own image. So we have the rationality of God, to get back to the prim primary cause. We have the, uh, the knowledge of God, basically. We have access to the world, thanks to the creator who gave us the freedom to create. And when, when the Jesuits, to just name your favorite group, when they went to China, they were amazed how little the Chinese knew about science. Yes. And we nowadays, yeah, not right now, but let's say 40 years ago, five decades ago, uh, physicists began to discover that there would not have been science without a Judea-Christian background and belief. Um, the, 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 the very famous one, for instance, is Whitehead. He, uh, he told in 1920 to a Harvard audience that without Christianity, we would not have science. And they were all baffled. And he showed them why there would not have been science. So, and, and since then, there have been several physicists. Whitehead was a, was a mathematician, but uh, there have been several physicists who have proven basically, so far as you can prove something, that uh, without Christianity, we would not believe what we believe. So we, uh, we have to thank Christianity, and without Christianity, we would not have really science. It would not be there. So we, uh, we cannot 
we, we, we can only do science if we have the faith that there is a creation we can explore. And reliably, that's important too. You know, in my own field of studying scripture, I read a lot of pagan mythology. Yeah. And I, I want my students to examine the other stories of creation from Babylon and Sumer and Egypt and Assyria and so on, and Greece. And uh, th th it's important for them to see this. But I like to point out that in those cultures, they began certain scientific research, but they couldn't sustain it. So yes. the Babylonians and the Egyptians needed to observe astronomy, but they quickly turned it into astrology yep. because Correct. they worshiped the sun as a god, the moon was a god, the stars controlled destiny, the gods used the stars to control the destiny of gods and men, according to the Enuma Elish from Babylon. And they gave up the science, whereas in Christianity, only God is God. The moon, the stars, the sun, the, the sea, none of those things are gods. And therefore, they can just be studied by rational human beings without fear that the gods will avenge them for studying it. That's one of the key gifts of our faith. Yes. Oh, great, what you say. I agree 100 percent. Yep. But you say it better than I could. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, it's the other thing, too, that strikes me. I, I remember uh, there was a series on public broadcasting system about the universe. And it was uh, Dr. Sagan. And oh, yeah. he concluded, yeah, he concluded <laughs> this whole series that we're just tiny little creatures on a mediocre-sized planet from a yeah. mediocre sun about two-thirds of the way out of the center of the Milky Way. And therefore, we're not very significant and that there must yes. be people on other planets. I don't know if you remember that series. Yeah, and, and then he said we are just a speck of dust in, yes. in the universe. Yeah, yeah. Oh. but it's here's, unbelievable. It's it's arrogant, actually. Yeah, because here's the other reality. Because of the size of the Earth and its relationship to the sun of its size, we can have life that you couldn't on a bigger sun or a bigger or smaller planet. And because we're two-thirds of the way out from the Milky Way, we can see the rest of the universe. If the sun were at the center of the Milky Way, there'd be so much light from the other galaxies, we wouldn't know about the extent of faith, uh, of space. Of space, yeah. And you almost wonder... Did an infinite providential mind with all power put mankind on this planet with rational brains, rational minds, so that we could do science, so yes, that we correct. could investigate the universe, that yes. we have minds that are curious, and we can see so far. And we're the ones that exist, the only life that we know of. You'd almost think this was planned too. And it's planned so we can do science as well as have religious faith. 
I, I think you are perfectly right. It's, a, it, it's impossible to prove it, but it's a yeah. very clear pointer to that God did something. He made this earth our home. And he, 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 he chose this planet so we could do what we can do right now. And for people that is very baffling, they say, yeah, but the, the universe is so old and so fast. Why did that have to be? That means that we get so little, which is true. If you, if you look at the, at the age of everything in the universe, and I always compare it with one, we, one year. If the beginning of the year, January 1st, was the, 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 the Big Bang, we are now at December 31st. When did humanity start? on December 29th. Yeah, yeah. The last minute, basically, the yeah. last minute. And the dinosaurs that are so popular started only on December 24th. So uh, we are so tiny compared to the whole, whole history. Yeah, but there is a reason for it. Uh, everything has to be old because elements needed for life were forged inside the stars. Stars are factories of the elements. So in the lifetime of a star is a billions of years. So we, we need a long, long, long history. And why is the universe so fast? Because that is directly related to its age, um, dependent on the sure. Einstein's gravity. Yeah. So it, it has grown to a size of 40 billion light years. If the universe were any smaller, would not have lasted long enough for life, including human life, to emerge. So people who say, oh, we are just a speck of dust, I say, hey, come on. Uh, that is not an argument. That is just putting a, a bad thought in people's minds. Yeah. For there, there is a reason why the world, the universe is so old and so vast. And, now, and we are the crowning glory. Now, Dr. Fischern, I'm afraid that we are not the universe. We have run out of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in our yeah, last seconds, I want to thank you uh, for writing your book, A Catholic Scientist Proves God Exists, by Dr. Gerald Fischern. Get it at EWTNRC.com, item 1046. And let me just give you a blessing. May Almighty God bless you and all of our viewers with his wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you for being with us. And we thank all of our viewers for continuing to support us uh, through the COVID crisis so we can do these shows. God bless you and keep you going as well.